Greetings, ever give venture seekers on Ali Berman, your guide to demystifying your world. And today you're joining us for a fun filled time on a special edition, Let's Get Metaphysical show. And our guest is somebody you've seen before, and she's back to wow you again and an even different way. And I welcome you, my good friend, Paula Ensign. Thank you, Ali. It's always a joy to be with you. We managed to manifest some of the most incredible things together. <laughs> and would you just briefly share instead of I'll put in the show notes, everybody, so that you can go back to the original, more straightforward show that we did, and all the longer bio is there. So here today, Paulette, would you just let us know something that our listeners would want to know would be helpful for them to know? Yes. Well, I shared with you that when we talked about having me back again, and you said, was there something, some experience that I had in my life that might be interesting or helpful or humor, entertaining or any or all of the above? And I had no hesitation thinking back on the summer of 1985. It came back to me in an instant. That summer, what I did was it, I, I took a personal growth training course. And during that summer, it was the third offering that this organization did, that this company did. The first one was known as basic and it was, and it was helpful. And it was a strong stepping stone for the next step, which was known as advanced. That was one of those thought I'd die and afraid I wouldn't um, as far as expanding. <laughs> my my worldview and my risk factors as far as beliefs and actions were concerned. But the third one, the third one was completely different. And it was spread out over a period of about three months. And what has been known as second weekend in those days, I, I understand that they had to change it and you'll understand why as I un unfold this story. Um, the second weekend replicated what was like an outward bound kind of a day. I don't know if that company is still in existence, outward bound to make reference to it, but what it was, was something that was so outside of my comfort zone, like what comfort zone? There was no, no view of comfort anywhere. <laughs> in this. <laughs> so to even use that phrase of comfort zone is, is not even a comparison of anything or a measure of anything. And it was an outdoor day that included things like repelling down a rock that was pretty much vertical, climbing back that same rock, which stayed vertical, a ropes course, and a bunch of other things. But the three things that I mentioned as far as the rock up and down and the ropes course were the absolutely the most profound parts of that day for me. Uh, and, and lasting, I mean, I, I wanna share with, with you today the specifics of what came from that that were terrifying, that were exhilarating, that were gigantic, learning opportunities, gigantic. You know, may I, I interrupt and ask a question because I, I've done something similar to that. Were you in a, I don't remember what they called like a harness and there was somebody holding you so you didn't have to, okay. Just wanted to be sure. Yeah, except I did it my own way, of course, because that is how I live my life. Um, I'm a firstborn, uh, I'm a Virgo. I absolutely embrace my uniqueness. And if somebody calls me normal, you know, I mean, I, I have to ask them to qualify what they mean by that. Uh, I've done a lot of personal work in my life and have just, just re recently completed uh, 
quite a substantial era of a lot of self-improvement work. So these things, as I'm sure you know, and lots of our people who are uh, who are our audience today are aware that these things don't happen and then they're just done. And I, I don't know about you, but I've had plenty of opportunities to go, gee, I thought I fixed that one already. And yeah, I fixed that level of it. I, I grew on that particular level of it. And then it circled around and came back on another level. And it was like, okay, now we're ready. <laughs> now we're ready to really move forward. <laughs> and uh, I, I will keep this being a family friendly <laughs> interview, but um, there were some words that came out of my mouth that uh, as a former East Coaster, we're not so unusual, but at any rate. So shall I proceed or do you want to stop me and ask oh, me anything I'm particular? I'm right an East Coaster and I don't have that experience. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear completely. I'm an East Coaster, I'm a New Yorker, so, but I haven't had the <laughs> vocabulary change. <laughs> well, at any rate, I'll, I'll, I'll not go any further in that direction. <laughs> uh, so the group that I was part of, the large group, had probably 80 people in it. And then from that group, throughout the entire three months, we were assigned to small groups. And the small groups really functioned very cohesively. So we knew each other well, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the first thing that I can remember on this day and this was in Northern New Jersey, the, the, the particular location of the training that I had been in for that three months was in Manhattan, in New York City. Oh. But this particular day was in Northern New Jersey, along Route 80 someplace. And it was at a facility that was equipped with staff, well-trained staff to aid our ongoing leaders in our small groups. And of course, like anything else in life, we had a wide range of interests, of capabilities, of attitudes. And like everything else, I took it my own unique way. So the repelling was the first thing. And I was given very specific instructions and to back out a couple of steps and then go down this rock with somebody, a few somebodies who were at the top of that rope. I was definitely in a harness and a rope and I am never going to pass for Twiggy in this lifetime. So, you know, I was giving people maybe a little bit extra challenge on top of that, as far as making sure I only moved when I intended to move and not just fell. So I'm backing down, I'm taking steps backwards on this rope. I mean, the first one, like so much else in life, that first step was the hardest one mm. in that particular moment. It's like, you want me to do what? <laughs> <laughs> I looked down, I saw how far down it was. And uh, yeah, I added some adjectives and adverbs in there. And uh, I said, you want me to do what I think I heard you just, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I was not the first person to do it in our group. So that helped maybe a little tiny into it a bit. So I did it and I survived fine. And it was one of those things in life that I never would have imagined. I wouldn't wake up one morning and say, gee, I think I'm going to go repelling today. But wait, there's more. So... <laughs> At some point, and now it's far enough behind me that I don't remember some of the details that are inconsequential anyway, as to whether we then immediately went to climbing back up that rock. So for our purposes today, I'll just pretend that that's what happened next. And in those days, I was getting a manicure and I wasn't teaching string instruments anymore. I wasn't playing the violin anymore. So it was okay for my nails to be past the end of my fingers, which may sound like a so what, except for the fact that for a lot of my life, I was a violinist and you can't have fingernails past the end of your fingertip. 
So, you know, I went for the full, full deal of getting manicures. I was doing a lot of speaking and I wanted to look as good as I possibly could. So here's my nails with polish and nicely done. And I'm climbing this rock and I'm going and the people who were in my small group were cheerleading me on. And they were saying, Paulette, you know, put one, put your right hand up six inches and there's a place you can grab the rock there. Move your left foot up a little bit more. So they were cheerleading and I was going, I wasn't even breaking a nail or chipping a nail, which of course in the grand scheme of life is for everyday stuff, doesn't really matter. However, it adds to this story uh-huh. that, you know, I was functioning fine. I was climbing this rock. I get to almost the top of it. And one of the two leaders of our small group that we had been with for the three months, laying belly down on the very top. And I'm maybe two feet from the top. And this was a pretty substantial climb. I don't know what the measurement of it was. And frankly, I don't care because the numbers didn't matter. The experience mattered. So I am convinced I am wedged in and I'm very close to the top. And this other leader from our group laying belly down on the top and he's speaking to me very quietly. And he says words I will never forget in my life. He says, come on, Paulette, one tit at a time. Well, I totally cracked up laughing, forgot that I was scared and just went right up over, which again was another profound lesson because my brain had convinced me that I was stuck, that I could not go that little distance more. I was convinced. I mean, and that brain conversation got louder, not conversation, but uh, monologue got louder and louder and louder and convinced me more and more and more that I was stuck. I didn't know what the heck was going to happen next, but I was convinced that was my reality. But as soon as he said that, and he was kind of a, he was, it was kind of a, 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 I mean, he was a pleasant guy, no question about it. But to hear that come out of his mouth was almost not, it was almost out of character for him. And yet it was the perfect thing to say to me. Absolutely the perfect thing to say to me. And, you know, it accomplished, as I just mentioned, uh, a substantial learning Mm. that when I start to put my intellect to work, that may not be the best tool to use in that moment. That the brain power, mm mm-mm not necessarily always the best tool. However, humor and I get along really well, whether it's coming from me or whether it's coming to me. And he realized also that my personality was such that he could get away with that. You know, somebody else might be offended and get distracted and who knows, I don't even wanna put what the maybes could have been. Mm -hmm. However, he had the right tool, to the right audience at the right time. (laughs) And as professionals, boy, how many times do we really have to backpedal and kind of reassess when things aren't going the way we thought we wanted them to go? Whether it's in a speaking situation or a consulting situation or whatever it is, that things aren't going exactly the way we thought or how they looked like they started And we do, we need to stop and see what else is in our toolbox. And rest assured that learning moment has lived with me since 1985. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's a while ago already, quite a while ago. And I still have friends from that that era uh, who have stayed with me, who have been part of my inner circle and other folks disappeared and that's life. So the rock, The rock was up and down or down and up, but wait, there's more. Oh. (laughs) There was this rope course and the rope course consisted of a high wire to walk across. And it also consisted of a rope ladder. If you can imagine that, that had no resistance to it. And I do not even remember at this point how I got up there. I think it might've been (laughs) that 
there was um, like a leaning rope ladder, but it was almost like triangular so that there was more to grab and it was, it was gradual so that I ultimately got to where I needed to get to. And yes, I was harnessed and yes, there were all kinds of ropes on me and around me and whatever. And I get up to where the rope ladder is and I'm, I'm playing Tarzan. I am up there, drama queen, supreme, Peter Pan. I can't do this, I can't do this, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> One of the people who was attached, and at that point I couldn't do it. One of the people who was attached to that property as an employee shimmies up this tree next to me. Now I'm having all of this difficulty. He just shimmies up the tree. <laughs> He's like, don't worry, we'll help you. We'll get through this. And, you know, and I wanted to throw a few words at him too. It's like, look, wise guy, you know, I'm, I'm really not having a good time here. So he did help guide me. And I ultimately did manage to somehow climb up this non-resistant ladder to the, the, the high wire that went across. And again, I am playing drama queen up there. It was not a conscious thing, I assure you, but I was yelling and screaming and carrying on like somebody who was, you know, at the end of their lifetime or something. I don't know what, how, how to define that, but what I found out later, and I still have a few more details to share with you about this rope course, what I found out later was because I took so much time doing what I did, there were a handful of people in my small group that never had the opportunity to experience it. And of course, the leaders of our group said, there's the lesson too. You know, that there were so many things, no matter what role you were playing in that experience that day. Now, had I been at the end of our group to try, I would have been golden. <laughs> I mean, I remember when I got to, un to undergraduate college, there were few buildings on the campus and the music and the art students didn't have to take phys ed. I was in my glory. Oh. <laughs> I mean, this was fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, physical activity like that has never been first on my list, even to this day. I mean, it's just not my go-to. So there I am. And this guy who shimmied up the tree talking very nicely. He didn't come out with anything like what the other guy who had been with us, who was talking me through my stuckness. I see this wire and I, this rope, high wire, and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, how am I gonna get from here to there? And I mean, it was right there. I could put my foot on it. However, my brain, again, my brain kicked in and said, that's not the best way to do that. Mm. So I went butt first and got onto that high wire. And when I ultimately got back down safely, the guide attached to that property said, you know, we've never seen anybody do it that way. That had to be the hardest way possible. <laughs> I said, I saw it as the only way. Now, again, gigantic lesson, gigantic lesson. Nobody told me that that was the hardest way to do it. But my viewpoint was, that's the only way I can imagine doing it. So talk about the blinders being right here. How often in life does that become part of our reality? I only see it being done one way. Well, that's the hardest way. We've never seen anybody do it that way before. So I did get across there and um, I think think back that it is summer and that it is um, getting to be like five o'clock. <laughs> and even though we're not approaching sunset yet, the, the light has changed mm -hmm. in this whole experience. So apparently I, I didn't take so much time that nobody could follow me, but the entire group didn't have a chance. Mm -hmm. So there were a couple of people after me who were a 180 from my attitude about doing things like this. Mm -hmm. And they were comfortable, they were enthused about it, they were stoked, they were good at it. 
So the guides had them do it blindfolded. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> and they just did it, you know, like monkeys. I mean, they just went, okay, this is my habitat. I'm just going to go and I'm going, really? R really? <laughs> So as the day ended and I realized that no body parts of mine had been damaged and that maybe my ego took a hit, but so what? That's not the first or last time. Um, and that I had done all of these things and I was still recovering from the emotional aspects of all of it. And there definitely were other activities where trust falls, things like that, off a trampoline and that a group of people had to catch you. Well, how many people have you and I each met in our lives, including me, I'll cop to that, have had trust issues? Well, that's a different kind of risk than that high wire rope situation and the repelling, but boy, it still can be a big risk of trusting somebody, especially with your physicality, especially with that. So there were lots and lots of things that were part and parcel of that entire day and the things that I mentioned to you clearly, easily stand out. And that now I have been able to see them for what they have been, you know, to see them as, yeah, I accomplished things that I never thought I could accomplish. And that I did it in what actually was a safe environment with lots of guidance and lots of people to pick up the slack and in situations that in many cases, I haven't even articulated the way I did just now. So that the further it gets in the rear view mirror, the more value I see to what those risks actually turned into. And of course, the very next day after all of this, we were back into this hotel ballroom where we had been meeting as an entire big 80 people group. And a couple of the uh, small group leaders, they knew that I was ripe for picking on <laughs> and said, Paulette, I think you learned a few things during that experience, didn't you? Like rock climbing, you know, so what were the magic words that allowed you to get unstuck? <laughs> and, you know, I mean, again, they knew their audience. They knew that I, they, that I didn't have any issue sharing that. And that it, I'm sure in some different kinds of ways was helpful to other people that at that moment intellectually, rather than actually being in the experience that I was in, but nevertheless may have served some positive um, purpose in the experiences that other people had in their lives. So I have not talked about that whole day in wow. many years. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to do that because now, you know, I mean, I used to really <laughs> look down upon it in certain ways <laughs> and say, what did I ever do that for? But the more and more um, journey, you know, bricks of the journey that I travel, the more I realize what a really magnificent gift that was for me, tapping my willingness to stretch, tapping my trust, tapping my physicality, which has been a lifelong issue for me in, in really seeing my body as my friend rather than my enemy, because I had really established lots of evidence about not being good friends with my body. So all of those different things that we talk about in let's get metaphysical, you know, Higher power knew, okay, you're up for this. You got the stuff to do it. Just get over yourself. <laughs> you know, and as simple as that sounds, um, it looks better in the rear view mirror than it did looking straight ahead. And here we are. <laughs> so I have a question for you. If you had it to do over again, uh, would you do it? Knowing what I know today or yeah. as a novice? Knowing what I know today, um, I want to quickly say yes, although that's just a little too quick for me to answer that question. <laughs> wow. um, you know, I'm not looking to play hero here uh, because what I have said consistently since then is, okay, I've done that once. Don't need to repeat it. 
my my awareness takes me to there have been lots and lots of other opportunities mm. since then in different ways to test where I am with the trust, with going beyond my limiting beliefs, with my relationship to my body, with lots of things outdoors, just the physicality of it, um, that that were advanced course from there. So I don't, I don't think that it really matters if I'm willing to <laughs> repeat that again, because now when I take inventory, I realize there's been plenty of other things that have come in at a more advanced level, just like what I was saying at the very beginning of our, our visit today, that um, we think we've got one thing fixed and then it comes back around and the spiral higher and that really connects what your question was just now, would I do it again? And what I responded to you about how there's been so many other things that look different, but strip it away. And it was definitely stretching to the next place in various aspects of my spirit and my spirit in this body. It um, reminded me, I went, to something called Enlightened Warrior Camp. It was a whole week. So there was stuff similar, but quite different from what you were doing. And then some other things that we're not supposed to talk about, but you had to earn the t-shirt from the camp. They didn't just give it out. And I've always been an outdoor person. I grew up climbing trees and rocks. So I loved everything that we did, especially the part that I was always in a harness. So if I couldn't reach, because there were times when I'm supposed to jump from here to there, I don't see how I could possibly do it. So I got to fly <laughs> because they lowered yeah. me down. I like that feeling a lot. <laughs> well, it probably looked pretty funny when I did it. Um, <laughs> you know, I can't do this. I can't. <laughs> Convincing myself. <laughs> but you, you know, and this is, that's the perfect example to put up next to what, how I characterized my experience. You talked about how it was a wonderful feeling for you to feel like you could fly. <laughs> my experience of flying in a harness with ropes and people around me was terrorizing. Wow. I wasn't seeing the fun part of it at all. I was so consumed with how awful I decided that this was. Wow, that's such a great point because I teach people what all the religions and all the spiritual groups ever since recording of time, it's all about being happy. And if yeah. you're not feeling happy, it's because you are blocking it. It's your default way of being. So, and what keeps you from being feeling happy? The thoughts you're thinking and the feelings that you're having. So if I catch myself in a place where I don't feel incredible, that's where I go to. I just like the, um, the guy who distracted you in the first place. I, I do my own distracting to put my brain someplace else. Well, let me back up then. When you asked me, knowing what I know today, and as our conversation is unfolding, that would be now another piece for me to put into the mix. And that just because my experience was what it was in 1985, doesn't mean that those same steps need to look the same way. Because I'm at a different place in my life. Yeah by every definition. So for you to suggest that that could be fun, in the past, I couldn't even hear that, much less consider it. <laughs> like, what are you, out of your mind? Um, <laughs> fun? That's not how I define fun. And yet, it's not how I've defined fun up until now, which is something I love to punctuate sentences with, up until now, or yet. 
that that's cool. I do the same thing, and that's what when you're open to adventures, the universe says, "Okay, I'm going to give you a new adventure." Yeah, yeah. And for a long time, I my, my tagline was, "Are you open to the possibilities?" Well, so much for walking my talk. <laughs> <laughs> because those possibilities, the way I was defining them, again, looking backwards, had some pretty solid boundaries on them. You know, it was not wide open. But you did it because you were open, whether or not that was in your awareness. Yeah. You know, that's like when people uh, are more and less open to experiencing different cuisines. Oh, you know, there are people who don't want their food to touch each other on a plate. Yes. I don't understand that because it's all going to be in the same place in my stomach. <laughs> but yet then take that the next step as far as what their discernment is. And I say that as an observation, not a judgment. It's just different than how I approach food. The point is, I thought that I was like, oh yeah, I'm a foodie. I was in England a while back and England's not really known for having great food, but <laughs> I, I, was, I was taken to dinner and uh, pigeon was on the menu. And I thought, pigeon, hmm, okay. And the more we got closer to the wait staff coming over to take our order, I'm thinking, no, 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 I'm not doing pigeon. I know where pigeons hang out. I know the kind <laughs> of thing they do. I know they leave the evidence on my car windows. Um, <laughs> And, you know, and I tried all this intellectualizing and rationale. <laughs> it's a bird, just like a chicken is a bird. I ordered something else. I didn't order pigeon. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, when I go to the store, or I buy my meat right from the farms who raise them. And if I've never had it before, I get it. I might not always know what it is, but I get it. And I'll do the same thing in a restaurant. I'm very adventurous. I was married to somebody who wanted all the different dishes kept separate. And if we go out to eat with my mom, Chinese, she just took everything and mixed it all up. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can make yeah. them crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I've, I learned a long time ago that my palate tends much more towards sweet and that I don't, I don't like spicy. I just don't like it. I don't like the experience of it. I don't like the taste of it. And not very long ago, like a couple of months ago, I said to myself, I, I need to check in and see if that's still real, if that's still my current reality. And I tasted it. I said, no, spicy is not for me. <laughs> I'm spicy enough. I don't need the extra. <laughs> the sugar, I want to keep making sure that I stay sweet. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. My son-in-law eats the hottest food. Like I go on Amazon and I look for what's the hottest sauces to get them and he always says it could be hotter. <laughs> so you do enjoy spicy food then? No, I, I oh, you don't. don't. Um, sometimes it, it's okay, but where my health is now, it actually isn't good for me. So I don't like my mouth. <laughs> the way I learned which peppers were hot in the Thai restaurant was like, hmm, put it in my mouth. It was a half an hour before I could taste the next part of the meal. Give me a gallon of milk. I need to calm this down, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you're ever in that situation again, a chef told me lemon juice. Lemon so I'd always be sure there was okay. a dish of lemons if we were eating hot food. <laughs> that citric acid will cut it, huh? I don't know. I, I trusted him. And because I trusted him and believed it, whether or not it's a fact for me, I think it worked. So that's what I have for you for today. As far as my experience that uh, only the people that I knew during that era know about it, because it isn't something that I want to tempt anybody in my current circles of, you know, who I didn't know from back then. Um, We've all traveled a lot more bricks on the journey since then, since 1985. So uh, that's, that's that. One of the people in our small group was somebody, was one of the people that was, was blindfolded to do it. And he always enjoyed ice hiking, mountain hiking. Whoa. And um, all around the world, 
around the world. And he was very skilled at it. And apparently his skill didn't matter because um, a couple of months ago, he was lost. And when they found him, he was under four feet of snow and they didn't know whether it was an avalanche or whether it was a drift. And there's something to be said for passing on, doing something you love. So yeah, I know, and he loved it. I mean, he called me from Kathmandu in India, Nepal, one, one year, a million years ago. Wow. And I said to him, I cannot fathom that you enjoy this. Blessings on you, though. <laughs> Do what you love. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love what you just shared. It's kind of like being a stay-at-home mom and my kids were performers. I was never home. <laughs> they were always in the car for rehearsals and lessons and performances. That's not for everybody. Right. So if people knew my schedule, they would probably think, in fact, I didn't know anybody <laughs> who had the kind of life that I did. So but if it works for you and it makes you feel good. Yeah. So I, yeah, I watch people do the ice climbing and I just, I think they're nuts because how can you count on the ice to hold? But yeah, he probably yeah, think like base would. camp, base, base flying where you, you jump off a yeah. cliff and you land or you don't, I mean, you land. But the question is, are you still in one piece and are you alive? Are you There's talking people about that are adrenaline junkies? That's not mine. Oh yeah. I've watched extreme sports like that. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. I'm okay watching them. I wouldn't do them. Right. Like, like the 29 feet high waves that people surf. It's like I'll be a good audience for you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, is, if there's anything else you want to ask me, please feel free to. Otherwise, well, that's what I, I've got for you for today. I, I, I know that you've shaken up your business and you have a really cool business. I wondered if you'd share with me the changes that you made and the new stuff. Yes, um, I'm happy to do that. I do help subject matter experts, which means everybody on the planet, because my belief is we are all an expert at something, even if we haven't acknowledged that to ourselves. It doesn't require a degree. It doesn't require special training. It requires waking up in the morning, living your life, and noticing that, gee, I'm really drawn to whatever, or this experience in my life, other people may benefit by knowing about it. So for the past 30 years, uh, I've been very honored and privileged to be able to support subject matter experts in turning their knowledge into information products that are not books, that are not books. There's plenty of books around. There's lots of other people who do books. You may recall at the beginning of our conversation, I said, I really embrace my, my uniqueness. Um, I don't have the patience to write a whole book. However, I did write a booklet a long time ago and had a lot of success with it. Sold over a million and a half copies back in the early 90s into the early 2000s. And people wanted to know what I did to do that. Over a million and a half copies. It still amazes me today. Wow. And this has become my business where now the newer things are not only to sell printed copies of things, and yes, people still are printing, depending on how they want to use it. But there's also the opportunity to license the content, which means you're renting it. So with all of our activities that happen for many of us, not everybody, but for many of us online, there's endless opportunities to rent your, your information out to major companies, associations, smaller companies. I'd like to just share with you a couple of things that really are great examples of what I mean with taking an experience and or taking your, um, your formal education and putting it into other ways of delivering that so that you help lots more people, including yourself. 
I have a client who was a living organ donor for her mom. She donated part of her liver. Both my client and her mom are alive and well many years after. So we wrote a booklet with her wow. about organ transplants. And we did 25 tips for the donor to prepare to do the transplant and 25 tips, no, 26 tips. It's 52 tips altogether. 26 tips for the donor and 26 tips for the recipient. There's many, many communities that don't have a clue about the safety and the generosity and the need and the feeling from donating. And especially with a liver, which can regenerate itself. So not only did we do a booklet, but we also did an audio recording of the booklet. And we've done a few other things with this content. Um, she has also created a subscription so that the tips drip a tip a week so that it's not a book to have to read about it. It's immediate, what do I do now? I'm a donor, what do I need to do to prepare? So there's endless, endless ways. And her audience has been primarily nonprofits who have something to do with transplants. Wow. And where many times they'll have a donor, a member of their nonprofit who will sponsor the investment so that the nonprofit can distribute this information. Now, everything that we do can be doubled. And what I mean by that is, this is not only in print, this is also a PDF. This also can be pulled apart to put into a pre-scheduled delivery of email. So it is drip a tip a week. We did some really wonderful work with a children's author that I had worked with. She had already done a beautiful book. And again, I don't get into helping people create their book. There's plenty of people to do that. However, she already had the book. And what we did was we took two pages of the art, a two page spread and made jigsaw puzzles for it. We also did a card deck. We also did, she went into the recording studio and recorded it. So those are two good examples of how my company and I, my team and I help people who have been through really valuable experiences and want to share it. Their generosity is that, you know, they want to help people because they went through the experience without that information themselves. And it helps make a better world with each person that we can help. It just spreads. It just spreads. So we've got all kinds of ways that we work with people, whether it is one on one or one on a few, we do some courses. Um, we do manuscripts only of 52 tips, which are saleable, they are rentable. And I have yet, I, I have yet to find two of our clients who are the same. Every single person, we really treat individually because of who they are and what their knowledge is, what their style is, and everything else about them. Because as I said multiple times already, I embrace my own uniqueness, which lets me be much more open to responding to the people that we help and their uniqueness. And, and I love how you open that talking about everybody's an expert in some way. Oh yeah. I was talking with somebody yesterday and she said, I didn't realize all the stuff that I've always known, other people don't know it. That's right. And that is not unusual. We hear that all the time. Yeah, a friend of mine, we were out socially one day and she made some reference to white vinegar being a cleaning agent. Now she's intelligent, but mostly book smart. I'm on the more common sense side of it. So I looked at her and I said, what are you talking about? And she said, you don't know that white vinegar is a cleaning agent? I said, let me break this to you gently. <laughs> and the top thousand descriptors of my mom was never good at cleaning. 
So how could she possibly teach me something that she didn't know? She knew lots of other stuff, lots and lots of other stuff. So that's a very basic example of, yeah, you know, I, ever since then, boy, I feel great because I have hungry clothes that I spill things on and, you know, any surface. So to know that white vinegar can be a cleaning agent is really a big help. And we will be sure to put all the links in the show notes so people can follow up with you. And I thank you, thank you. Thank you for sharing. That was a pretty profound experience you shared with us. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> kidding, it was. <laughs> profound is the right word on that. <laughs> and it was very bold to share it with people who, probably oh, there are a lot of people who had that kind of feeling. Well, I really want to thank you so much for inviting me today to share that experience and personally to help me bring it back up into my consciousness so that I can continue to benefit from what those profound experiences were. So I'm grateful to you for that, Allie. All right. And I want to remind everybody to join our Facebook group. And if you also do me, do all of us a favor, if you go to our show page, you can very easily rate and review the show, get the word out. And if you share it with two friends today, that also may change two lives because people are searching. And I think there are some really cool experiences that we all get to enjoy today with Paulette. And the website for our show page where you can listen to or watch any episode will also be in the show notes. Remember to enjoy, that's capital I-N, capital J-O-Y, every moment because nothing happens out there. You see inside, you hear, taste, touch, smell, everything happens within so enjoy, and I'll see you here next time.